Hello and everybody and welcome to the Mythgard Academy's gosh what is this our third official course I think of this year not counting the two towers class which was a pilot class yes I believe this is our third official class this semester uh, and uh, we are beginning our first non-Tolkien class Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card um, just uh, for a brief introduction for those of you who might be new with us here um, first off, uh, I want to make sure that you feel free to contribute to discussion during class. Um, on your GoToWebinar control panel, you will have you will see a little questions box where you can type in questions and comments. I encourage you to feel free to contribute if there are questions that you have um, related to what we're talking about. You can certainly ask those or comments if you want to if you want to sort of contribute to the discussion. I'll often ask you questions um, that I'll be interested to hear what observations you might have. Um, and of course, if you want to suggest other topics of conversation, you are welcome to do so. I, I would be very interested in that. Um, just make sure that you preface your comment, uh, if you want to change the subject completely, um, uh, uh, preface your comment with the word topic so that I can, uh, I can see at a glance what you're trying to do and find it later if I want to come back to it later. Um, so I might not be able to get to everybody's comments because uh, there are quite a few people here, but um, but anyway, I, I do hope that uh, uh, that you will contribute as we go. The Mythgard Academy, of course, is uh, uh, and you know this year is uh, the the first inaugural year of the Mythgard Academy. It is a series of open discussion classes that we're having on books chosen by our supporters, chosen by uh, you know by our by our people, by democracy. Um, so, you know, we have, uh, these classes are, of course, open for everybody to participate. There, you know, we will be posting recordings. I should explain that at the outset, of course. Uh, recordings of this class will be posted in three different places. Um, they will be posted, uh, they'll be linked to on the class website, on the Mythgard.org webpage. So if you go to Mythgard.org uh, and look at the, uh, the Ender's Game uh, page under the Academy heading. You will find uh, this page with all the links for the sessions, and once the sessions are finished, you will find the links to the recordings as well. Um, the second place you can find it is in our podcast feed. We have a podcast, uh, a Mythgard Academy podcast, that is set up uh, on iTunes. Uh, you can also get it, uh, get it directly through any RSS reader. Um, uh, so that's uh, that that's simple enough, and there's a link to that also uh, to the RSS feed directly if you prefer that uh, on the class webpage. And third, we also have a, a course for the Ender's Game class set up on iTunes U. Um, so look for Signum University, which is the parent university of the Mythgard Institute, um, and in the Mythgard University section of iTunes U, you will see an Ender's Game class now alongside the Unfinished Tales class and the Lord of the Rings classes that we had been doing previous to that. In any of those three places, you can get the exact same recording. They're all the same, but just different uh, methods that you know different people prefer. Uh, you can get either a video or an audio recording. So if you uh, if you miss part of the class and want to catch up later, if you you know have somebody that you know that couldn't make it live and you want to share it with them, uh, you know those are the ways those are the ways for doing that. Um, as I said, the topic of the course was chosen democratically. Uh, this course is free for everybody to participate in and for anybody to listen to and download. Um, but if it's not, of course, completely free to produce. Uh, so in order to raise the funds to do this series of free classes, we have uh, we had a fundraiser in the fall um, where we raised uh, plenty of money to uh, uh, to run classes for the year, so that was really great. Um, you know, so it's kind of like PBS. These classes uh, 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 brought to you by the generous support of viewers like you. Um, so that's that's been really great. And so everybody who participated above uh, a certain level, everybody who donated twenty five dollars or more, gets to vote uh, to decide what our uh, what our classes get to cover. Those who donated a hundred dollars or more are part of the Council of the Wise, who nominate the books that we talk about. Um, I uh, wait just like everybody else uh to see <laughs> which books we're going to end up talking about uh thus far we had the return of the king first completing the lord of the rings series that we'd already that we, that we'd been doing uh then people chose on tolkien's unfinished tales and now ender's game by orson scott card um the this class is scheduled to run through uh the beginning of may um run you know about the probably about the third or, or fourth week of may is when we will start our class after this um so i imagine that before 
before too long the process of selecting the next class um, will get going. Uh, if you would like to get involved, it's not too late to get involved. Um, there's a uh, you can you can still add your support alongside your fellow classmates. Um, we have a PayPal button at the bottom of our class page uh, where you can donate, and any donations will be sort of counted as if you had participated during the campaign, so that you can still be a part of nominating, discussing, selecting, voting uh, on the next book. So you can try to campaign uh, for your favorite book uh, for us to go through and and, uh, and and talk over next. So that's a brief introduction to the Mythgard Academy for those of you who are new. Now let us move on to Ender's Game. First, I want to uh, lay down one ground rule for our discussion on Ender's Game, and that is I only want to talk about Ender's Game. That is, I know that the, you know there's a series of books that come after this, and I don't want to talk about the rest of the books in the series. And I, I, I want to so try to restrain yourself. You know, if you're a fan of the series, I, I know it's going to be hard, but try to restrain yourself. And I want to focus on this book. And there are two reasons, two very good reasons. Okay, three, three very good reasons why I want to do that. One, the first very good reason is that, of course, not everybody who is uh, uh, you know who is participating in the class here will have read them all. You know, so it's really only fair to to try to restrict our conversation to the books that we are the book that we are reading and that we are discussing, so everybody can be on the same basis. Uh, that's that's one uh, good reason. The second reason is an even better reason, which is that I myself have not read the other books in this series. Um, I like this book a lot. I've read it uh, many times, um, but I actually haven't read the rest of the books in the series. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm not going to be able myself to talk about the rest of the books in the series. So that's another very good reason why I'm not going to talk about them. Um, but the third reason, and this is something that I would uh, that I would really want to lay stress on, is that I think that in thinking about it that way, um, that is. If, when reading Ender's Game, you're thinking ahead to incidents in later books and, you know, concepts that are raised later on, it's not that those connections are irrelevant. They're certainly relevant if you're thinking about the series as a whole. But when you're focused on this book, it's one of the reasons why I am a very big fan of reading books in the order in which they were conceived, in the order in which they were written. I am a strong um, anti uh, I, I, I'm, a, I, I'm a strong opponent of, you know, the trend towards taking a series which was written in an order which is not which does not match the chronology of the world in question and reshuffling them after the fact. Of course, the most serious and inexplicable. Uh, 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 really almost unforgivable instance of this is the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, the uh, ridiculous, newfangled, utterly unacceptable renumbering of the books of the Chronicles of Narnia, which I absolutely cannot pour sufficient scorn upon <laughs> myself. Um, uh, but there have been other examples, as for instance, uh, uh, Isaac Asimov's Foundation series. But anyhow, um, I think that uh, for me, it is always so rewarding to see how these books uh, unfold, how the how these stories unfold as they go along. Um, it's it's I'm not gonna I'm not going to uh, um, I'm not going to uh, I'm tempted, of course, to segue into to, to having having uh, having opened uh, that door a little crack. I'm tempted to go uh, launch on a further Narnia rant, but I shan't because that's not what we're talking about here tonight. Um, but anyway, again, thinking back to Ender's Game, um, there are many other issues and ideas that come up. I mean, I know I, as I, I know some, uh, you know, a few things about the series that comes after, and um, you know, there are many things that come in and there are things that are that are that are brought out and further emphasized. But I think that we can quickly lose grasp of this book as a whole. I want to be considering this book as as an individual unit. It existed. Um, you know, and and it is a really fascinating work in itself. One of the things that I really particularly like about this book, one of the, or I should say, one of the things that I especially admire about this book, um, is how tightly interwoven it is uh, in itself. You know, the way in which recurring ideas and themes not only are brought together consistently in this book, but play off each other in what I think are really fascinating ways. I think that this is a really rich book in that way. Um, and therefore, again, if we're, if we're sort of taking ideas which gain a significance in later books, 
Again, that's interesting in the context of the series, but it's less interesting in the context of this book. It, in fact, detracts from our focus on this book and gets us just to focus on, you know, this as one part in a larger thing. So, um, in order to focus on uh, the intricacies of this story and not to be overlooking what's going on in this story, even if those end up turning in different directions, um, I, uh, I want to, uh, um, I, I want to be, be focusing on this. So, anyway, um, uh, Neo is asking about the uh, w- whether we're talking about the first edition or the revised edition. Generally, I, Neo, I tend to prefer the revised edition. Um, certainly, especially you know when done in the author's lifetime. I, I mean, it it can be interesting to compare back and um, uh, you know, Jonathan, as you've mentioned, there's uh, the the whole story, of course, started um, as Orson Scott. Orson Scott Card himself explains as a short story originally Ender's Game and that the novel Ender's Game came from his combination of two things. He had, you know, two stories, Speaker for the Dead and Ender's Game, which he combined uh, and, you know, that, that the, the sort of the, the marriage of those two stories became the novel Ender's Game. Um, but, um, see, Neil, the revised edition was 1991, you say? I'm, 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 uh, I, I, I don't have it at hand here, so I I will uh, submit myself to your correction there, Neil. Um, But, um, anyway, so, I mean, it's it's interesting, you know, I mean, that, looking at the way that that evolved is fascinating. I mean, of course, I mean, as, as, as I'm sure you all know, I'm a Tolkien guy, and so I really, you know, I am always fascinated to see how, uh, how an author's thought unfolds um, and the way that a story grows. Um, but, um, uh, so, so, you know, it's that that's it would be a really cool study uh, to be looking closely at you know the changes that are made in the revised edition the um, uh, the the um, uh, the short you know the, the 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 way that the short story is transformed into the novel there's be a lot to really look at there but we're not going to have time to do that um, we're just going to uh, sort of dig into this book as a novel and Jonathan you're right um, Orson Scott Card has called uh, the, the the audio drama the unabridged uh, reading of the book as uh, as his preferred text as uh, Card explains he was by sort of training and inclination first and foremost a dramatist uh, he, he, he primarily wrote things for the stage and turned to fiction by his own account, uh, when he couldn't make any money as a dramatist to support himself, and so uh, tried his hand at fiction. Um, so, um, anyhow, that that's uh, so. Yeah, he does explain that. Uh, you know, he 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 loves uh, you know dramatic performance of things, and that he uh, that he really really liked uh, the reading the uh, the the audio drama. Um, that that in his version, in his eyes, it's like the ideal. Uh, version of the text um, that I myself am a big fan of. That I'm a massive audiophile to begin with, so I, in fact, am also reading the uh, the the audio version as well. Um, I know not everybody is, so I'm probably not going to comment on it too much. But I might. Uh, I, Card's comments there give me an excuse to refer to it sometime, so I might, in fact, do that. Um, but anyway. Another thing I wanted to mention before we uh, before we start looking in detail uh, at the story is I, I just want to recognize sort of acknowledge from the beginning um, the fact that this is a book I know which has I mean I've already heard from several people who have said the same thing um, this is a book which is not only a book enjoyed and admired by many people but a book which was always which has been for many many people. A deeply meaningful part of their own childhood. There, as a, you know, when we announced this class and have been talking about it, there have been several people who have emailed me to tell me about that. Even, in fact, to express trepidation about doing the class because, uh, you know, there was something really, uh, you know, sort of uh, very sort of privately significant to them about this story. And I just want to, you know, sort of recognize that, acknowledge that moving forward. I think that I can easily, you know, th- this wasn't the case for me, I, I think, you know, quite likely because I didn't uh, discover it at the right time. Um, I never read this as a child. Uh, I first read this book when I was an adult. Uh, in fact, it was within the last 10 years. I just missed it. It was one of those many books that I missed as a kid. Um, 
One of the reasons that I have the particular relationship that I do with Tolkien is not only did I love Tolkien when I was a kid, but I didn't have that many other books. Um, I had a very small number of books, and I lived in the middle of nowhere. So I read those few books that I had again and again and again and again. It's one of the reasons why I know Tolkien as well as I do. Um, uh, but it also means that I missed a whole lot of books that, uh, that many other people didn't. Um, so I'm coming at this from an adult, and so I, I know that I myself am not, you know, am not really uh, sort of sharing exactly that 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 same experience. But I can easily understand that. I mean, there's a way in which, um, you know, this book taps into some pretty uh, into some some pretty heavy stuff, some some pretty deep stuff, and, and, I, and we're going to try to get at, uh, you know, sort of to talk about some of those things. Um, and, but I can easily see, in fact, you know, as sort of putting myself imaginatively back into my own childhood. I kind of guess it, I, it might have hit me that way, too, had I read it at the right time uh, instead of much later. Um, uh, yeah, you know, Jonathan asks a really good question. Um, you know, is Ender's Game a children's book? Uh, is it a young adult book? Um, by the way, my, my personal opinion, I kind of feel like the genre that is called young adult is kind of a wussy genre. That is to say... I'm not a big fan of genrefying things anyway. Um, I, I, I don't. I think that the way that we tend to want to pigeonhole books tends to be a, a weakness. Um, actually, exactly the kind of weakness that I suspect Ender Wiggin would see through. It, to me, to take a book and have to put it into a category that, like, you can't, um, you know, you, you have to sort of separate books like this. Um, seems to me to be similar a similar kind of thinking uh, to those people at uh, battle school who are always insisting on retaining the gravity of the hallway that they came in by. Um, and I think that the YA genre is to me a particularly weak uh, sort of thing. I mean, it's so broad. Uh, um, I mean, I, I think of the comments that Tolkien made about children's books and how, you know, people th talk about, when they talk about books for children and stories that are fit for children, they tend to think of, you know, they, they, they tend to make one almost unconscious um, error, which is to consider children as if they are a separate class of people. And they're not a class, other than the fact that they're all the same age, they vary really quite tremendously in their abilities and interests and everything else. Um, young adults, same way. So what exactly is a young adult book? Anyway, um, Orson Scott Card says that he did not write this book, and this book was not intended for children. He was not envisioning. Again, you think about something like uh, something like The Hobbit, you know, something like Alice in Wonderland. You know, those are books that are written with a juvenile audience in mind. Um, Orson Scott Card said that he did not write this with uh, children in mind, um, and yet, in some ways, he was. Um, uh, he was um, uh, surprised almost to see how young were the children who were really latching onto this when he himself didn't really sort of thinking thinking about that. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, so then to me the question becomes not necessarily how did he mean to write it, but how does this story work? Or rather, you know, it would be an interesting question to sort of keep in mind as we're reading, um, you know, and as we're talking, as we're sort of talking about the ideas that this book is discussing, you know, I don't want to, the last thing I want to do is to make the fears of the people who are bringing to this class, as I said, a, a strong uh, emotional attachment that is deeply fraught with the, uh, you know, with the with the struggles of their own ch uh, childhoods. The last thing I want to do is, uh, you know, sort of put them on the examining table and make all of their nightmares come true. However, um, I still do think that when we, um, when we ask, when we're reading a book like this, I don't think it does any harm to ask the question, where does that power come from? The book clearly has. It has had a tremendous emotional power for many people. That doesn't seem to be a coincidence. That doesn't seem to be simply idiosyncratic to those particular strange individuals. Um, it seems there's, 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 there's a wide response to that. Um, can, we, I, can we find 
what is it that this book does? How does it how does it reach us? It's fascinating to see, um, and I don't. I think that we can do that without spoiling the mystery. You know, without 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 wrecking it. Uh, in fact, I know when I am asking questions like that about my favorite books, like when I'm asking things like that about about Tolkien, I have always come to admire and appreciate uh, uh, Tolkien more and more. Um, you know, the more I study, for instance, the way Tolkien handles his prose in the Battle of Pelennor Field, the way that, you know, and, and the... the <clears throat> the things that he's drawing on that make me cry every time I read the Battle of Pelennor Field and the arrival of Aragorn and the Black Fleet at the Harland. Um, the more I, 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 I think about that and read that, the, the, the harder I cry every time, not the less. Uh, so, again, I have not found in my own experience that, um, that really asking that question, um, you know, in this way is something that really that really wrecks it. Um, so anyway, so I hope that we'll be able to do that uh, uh, without uh, stepping on too many uh, too many toes. Um, let's see. Um, a couple of you have pointed out, uh, Carissa and Jonathan, both of you. You're absolutely right. Um, Jonathan says the pigeonholing into genres is great for sales. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's I I, I do think it's it's chiefly a marketing thing, um, and uh, I guess I can understand it on that level. But I think here is where we should be cautious. Um, again, ca- uh, that where we should be. Um, willing to think outside the box in an Ender Wigan kind of way. Um, because if we allow ourselves, it's one thing for marketing people, for bookstore owners and things to decide, you know what, if I divide books into these genres, then I can market them. I can target my marketing more effectively. If I can identify the demographic who is most likely to purchase this book and therefore target them specifically in my advertising, then I will sell more copies. You know, I have no objections to this. Um, I approve of the selling of lots of copies of books, in fact. So that's fine. Um, But I think that we should be careful not to let ourselves become too um, t- not to let ourselves become too bound um, by those terms because they become really easy for instance, one thing that I would point out and this seems a this seems a, a fine time to point this out this is our first work of science fiction right not only is it our, is it our first non tolkien work it's our first non fantasy work um, and I do not believe that Again, apart from the fact that we're told that fantasy and science fiction are are very different genres, you know, they're 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 often grouped together, of course, um, but still, they're different genres, right? I find that the, you know the continuity between science fiction and fantasy is 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 really important. I really love if we have to use a category, the category that I prefer, the one that I use when I describe, you know, what the Mythgard Institute focuses on is imaginative literature. You know, literature that says what if, literature that says um you know that 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 does again to use Tolkien's terminology that creates a secondary world, um, which is in some ways and in varying ways different, and to varying extents different uh, from uh, from the primary world that we are all uh, that we're all <laughs> familiar with. <laughs> Sorry, I was just noticing Sean's comment. He says the customer's wallet is down. Uh, yes, yes, that is that the, that that is an appropriate rationale uh, for a book marketer. I agree. Um, <clears throat> but um, uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, and and. Uh, uh, even the genre of science fiction is itself so varied. Uh, you know, there's so many different interests that different books have, you know, from uh, books which are really interested in speculating about what would what would happen to society if a particular, uh, you know, uh, if a particular scientific f- phenomenon happened. You know, like, given that we have a warp drive or something, what then does society look like? Um, you know, the, the the basis of the what-if question can be so different um, 
and the interest of the author and the interest that invited by the readers can be so varied. Uh, again, I think the best thing we can do is not try to pigeonhole. Um, I think that one of the last questions we need to be asking is, what other books is this book like? You know, what category can we put it in? What, what, what shelf does it go on? Um, that strikes me as a question which is rarely really useful, uh, and instead really just focusing on what the book is saying. But, um, let's, uh, Let's actually start uh, start talking about the book. What I want to do tonight is I want to look at some of the major things, some of the major themes, some of the things that come up a lot here. Uh, in the beginning, we're talking about the first six chapters uh, of the book here tonight through um, the giant's drink. Um, dividing this book into sections to uh, read together in four classes was really hard because the chapters are so unequal. The chapters are really short at the beginning and then enormously colossally long at the end of the book. Uh, so it made it really hard to break up. Um, but anyway, we're talking about, we're talking about the first six chapters today. The, the establishment of Ender from the, from the beginning, you know, the, the removal of his monitor in chapter one, all the way up through uh, his, you know, sort of his establishment of connections up in battle school before he gets placed into an army. Um, at the beginning of this book, though, the you know one of the important things to do at the beginning of any science fiction or fantasy book is really just sort of, I like to sort of take a take a minute and try to understand try to understand the world, try to understand where we are here. How does this, as a secondary world? What strikes you guys as what is sort of most important in trying to understand this world as a secondary world? What do you think are some of the most important elements that you would point to in this world? Um, and one that I will mention while you guys are thinking about that and while you guys are typing about that um, is, uh, I think certainly to me, obviously there's the major reality of the bugger wars, right? And that looms obviously over the entire story, not just because it's the premise of the whole, you know, we're setting up the third bugger war, um, but it just culturally and socially, the way in which it informs the outlook uh, and um, really determines the basis of the decisions uh, of, from big things, such as, you know, the choices that Colonel Graff makes in, uh, uh, in what he chooses to do to Ender and why, um, but uh, even the smaller things, like the way in which uh, the 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 environment which enables Peter to do what he does to Ender in some ways, um, uh, I, I think it's you know the the fact that we are in this world which is it's not a post apocalyptic world but it's a it's a it's a post near apocalyptic world right it, which is which which is a really interesting concept um, it is the world after a very close brush with apocalypse um, with with the destruction uh, of society and how the human world has reacted um, to that crisis um, and that I think is a really interesting kind of what if frame uh, in my world um, yeah, and a lot of the things that you guys are pointing to um, as uh, that you guys feel like are really important um, seem to me really interesting elements um, in that overall environment. Um, uh, government oversight, Carissa says, yes, that you know that notice how how many things are essentially excused, how many freedoms have been taken away, um, how many things are, have been sort of justified um, by the the threat of the buggers, because right? the buggers are out there, man, right? Um, uh, so we can't, you know, we've, we've got it. that means we've got to set some of our pers personal agendas aside, but it also means we've got to give up, we've got to be willing to give up so some of our freedoms, because, you know, we have to, we have to, you know, we have to be unified in establishing um, you know, uh, humankind's chances against the buggers when they return. The repression of religions, uh, Daniel says, absolutely, yes. Um, population restrictions, Kristen points out, absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, Sean is asking, you know, the, the one world government, um, Sean Smith says, you know, is it is it autocratic? Is it tyrannical? You know, Sean, it's a little, it's really unclear to me. We'll get it a little bit more into the politics later on, um, when we get in, you know, when we start talking about the Locke and Demosthenes stuff later on in the book, we'll talk a little bit more about the politics. Um, uh, but, um, uh, but one thing that which is to me a little bit interesting is that although there's this, you know, 
pretty clear evidence of, at least in some ways, what I think you would call an autocratic government. It's 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 also in the background. It's not a primary emphasis at all in this story. Um, it's something we only tend to see kind of indirectly. Um, uh, and and so in some ways it's a little bit hard for me to judge exactly you know how uh, you know Sean as you're asking sort of how tyrannical exactly is that government um, it's not entirely clear um, Jonathan points to a really important thing I think the separation uh, between uh, military uh, the, you know, the military off planet world and the down to earth politics the way in which the military is uh, almost not perfectly autonomous. Right, um, but again, you know, in those conversations between Colonel Graff and other people, who are often not even identified by name at the beginning of each chapter, which I love, by the way, I really like that as a framing mechanism um, of of this book. I think that's a, that's a really fascinating choice. Um, but uh, one of the things that we see there is not complete autonomy. We we, we know that. You know, Colonel Graff, for, for instance, they're, they're sending reports on him and everything. Um, he is not without accountability, and yet, at the same time, um, he has a pretty free hand to do what he wants, um, and obviously feels justified in doing what he wants, because, uh, because of the exigencies of the situation, right? He's the one who's responsible uh, for, essentially, he's the one who's responsible for defeating the buggers, right? So, uh, so he's, that gives him a free hand to do whatever he needs to do. Um, so yeah, that, that, that separation between um, the military and the rest of the, the politics. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Um, Sharon Powell makes a really good point. Sharon says, in the beginning, much of the secondary world is, is hidden. It's a mystery. I agree. We don't get, um, Card indulges in very little exposition, right? Um, we don't get much, um, much of what uh, uh, Michael Drought, Tolkien scholar, calls the dreaded chapter two of fantasy novels. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it, and you know, he's basing that model on the Fellowship of the Ring, as were as have many fantasy writers post Tolkien. Uh, that is, you know, the first chapter, something you know, usually you have some kind of action sequence. You you know you you you'll, you'll go right in with the characters, and then in chapter two, you'll have somebody telling the long story and giving the back history of whatever. Um, as ends up happening, of course, in you know the shadows of the past chapter in the Fellowship of the Ring, um, we get very little exposition. We get very little. Now let us go back and tell the entire story of the Bugger Wars and everything. You know, we get we 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 learn some stuff about it. Um, but we there's so much that we don't hear that we're only just learning very slowly as we go along, and some things that we never even really learn. Um, so that I thought I, th I thought was a really interesting, uh, um, a really interesting choice uh, on his part. Um, yeah, yeah. Laura says the government uh, is sort of eerily fascist if you get outside the young heads of the main characters. And Lars, you know, is picking up on Sharon's comment there. That I think is one of the one of the ways that the narrative really succeeds, in that it is sticking. It sticks pretty faithfully, I think, to the point of view uh, of the young characters. And they, I mean, Ender is not thinking about these bigger questions. He's not really concerned about the government and everything. Again, Valentine and Peter are going to get more concerned with it later on, but here, Ender's not thinking about you know, what's going on in global politics, right? He's not thinking about any of those things, and the the things that are introduced, things that we are told about, um, are just sort of mentioned in passing, right? They're things that, you know, that Ender, for instance, seems to sort of take for granted, right? Um, um, but yeah, I mean, there's, you remember even Graf mentioned that uh, when the monitor was in, uh, you know, that the instruments are, 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 are extremely sensitive and that they were able to see and hear everything that he saw and heard. And although he didn't understand everything he saw and heard, they did, right? Um, 
there's a sense in which we as readers are put into that same position, right? That we are, we're, we're, we're being shown Ender's point of view. The narrative itself serves as a kind of monitor. Um, th- there's a way in which that serves almost as a, almost as like a kind of a metaphor uh, for the, you know, this, this omniscient third person narrator, right? Um, which is getting us inside Ender's head and we're, we're hearing what he's thinking and we're following along with him and we're, uh, you know, we hear about what he's feeling and we, we know what goes on with him in private and what he says to himself. Graf was in that same position, right? And, you know, the monitor gave them that kind of access. And just as they understood more about what he was seeing and hearing than he did, while he was seeing and hearing it. So too, uh, Loris, I agree with you. I think that we can put some things together um, and perhaps draw some conclusions about the government in the world that, uh, that perhaps Ender him, that, that don't come directly into the narrative because um, uh, Ender himself is, is not, either not aware of them or not really, not really thinking about them. Um, yeah, good. Uh, several of you, of course, are, are, are talking about... Um, uh, the uh, the overpopulation issue, right? Um, even the fact, by the way, that it that it's an overpopulation issue. Um, notice how that doesn't exactly come up, right? The, the business about the third comes up, obviously, right? That's a major thing. Uh, it's the title of chapter one, right? Um, so the fact that Ender is a freak because he's a third, um, and you know that he's that he's uh, you know that he is nobody, that he has no rights because he's a third, as Peter tells him in chapter two, um, that that is a major feature, right? But the question of why is that? Um, okay, it's illegal to have a third child. Um, th- you know that that you know the, the government had to give special dispensation to permit the uh, you know the, the 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 conception and bearing of Ender. Um, uh, that you know we we learn about that. The word overpopulation doesn't get used. We're not actually told that there's a population problem on Earth. It's not obvious that there necessarily must be an overpopulation problem in order for that kind of restriction to happen. P- possibly, probably, but again, that kind of thing we're never told about. We learn about it later on, right, in the book. But we, but that's not something that's just sort of explained to us there at the beginning. Um. Yeah. Um. Good, good. Um, let's see. Yes, Christopher says, you know, one of the major themes that he thought was interesting was uh, that was trust about Ender not being able to rely on anybody. Um, and that, you know, how he's taught that over and over again. Um, yeah, yeah, that's something I want to come back to. I think that that's something that's uh, very interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, good. Uh, lots of, I wish I could talk about it, all of the um, comments, um, but I don't have, uh, um, I don't have, uh, I, 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 I want to make sure, uh, there's some parts of the text and some particular ideas I, I want to make sure we get to. Um, so, um, I don't, um, I don't have time to get to all the comments, but, uh, maybe I'll be able to bring back some of them. If there's some other things that you want to, um, uh, that you want to bring up, what we're going to be doing, I, I've scheduled some, uh, yeah, a couple extra, especially, uh, one extra session that I'm hoping to be able to spend on questions and answers and stuff, going back over things that we didn't have time to touch on. Um, so I hope maybe, you know, maybe we'll get time to go back and look at some of this stuff. Um, Let's look at... The first passage I want to look at here tonight is uh, Colonel Graff's pitch to Ender. Um, This does a pretty good job of um, sort of explaining uh, what the... uh, what the problem is, what the situation is, you know, what sort of the world environment is here. Um, This is his summing up. The buggers may seem like a game to you now, Ender, but they damn near wiped us out last time. They had us cold, outnumbered, and outweaponed. The only thing that saved us was that we had the most brilliant military commander we ever found. Call it fate, call it God, call it damn fool luck. We had Mazer Rackham. But we don't have him now, Ender. 
We've scraped together everything mankind could produce. A fleet that makes the one they sent against us last time seem like a bunch of kids playing in a swimming pool. We have some new weapons, too, but it might not be enough even so, because in the eighty years since the last war, they've had as much time to prepare as we have. We need the best we can get, and we need them fast. Maybe you're not going to work out for us, and maybe you are. Maybe you'll break down under the pressure. Maybe it'll ruin your life. Maybe you'll hate me for coming here to your house today. But if there's a chance that because you're with the fleet, mankind might survive, and the buggers might leave us alone forever, then I'm going to ask you to do it. To come with me. Okay. Um, one of the things that I find fascinating about this here is uh, the relationship that uh, Colonel Graff suggests between individual people and humanity as a whole. Um, the relationship between the individual and the collective. Um, this, I submit, is a motif that we get throughout this book. Um, and it comes in different ways, and it's an idea and a theme that transforms over the course of the book. But I think if we look carefully here, we can see a kind of conflict here, right? Notice on the one hand, what Graf is emphasizing at the end of this passage is basically the whole of humanity, right? Humankind collectively matters much, much more than any one individual person, right? Um, so maybe this is going to ruin your life, right? It's possible that I am doing something that's a really bad thing for you. In fact, even that I'm asking you to make a choice which is ultimately going to be self-sacrificial on your part, right? But if it's for the greater good of humanity, it's worth it. So the individual is to be subordinated to the whole, is to be subordinated to the collective. That, on the one hand, is a really strong element, a really essential element in what he's describing here, right? But on the other hand, there's this almost contrary movement. That is to say, why did they succeed the first time? In what way did fate, God, or damn fool luck intervene on their behalf? Not the general awesomeness of humanity, but an individual, right? Mesa Rackham. The only thing that saved us is that we had the most brilliant military commander we ever found. So that, in fact, historically speaking, uh, what saved humanity was the fact that one individual at the right place in the right time was greater than everybody else. Um, that, in other words, it's not just about the collective. It's about the individual. The individual is primary. Again, not the primary good. Um, but again, it's is it about conformity? Is it about submerge yourself? Submerge your own individuality? Sub, uh, uh, subordinate your own good to the good of the whole? Or is it about picking and selecting those individuals? That's what Graf does, right? That's his whole job. I'm going, well, I mean, he's I, the administrator of battle school. It's not his whole job, but it's a big part of his job, right? Is to recruit students, is to recruit those individuals, those extraordinary individuals who rise above uh, the bulk of humanity. And so, again, I'm not saying that these two things are, are self-contradictory. They're not self-contradictory, right? He's talking in different ways, where on the one hand, it was the extraordinary ability of that one individual, Mesa Rackham, which saved humanity. But that doesn't mean that individuals are more important than humanity, right? As a whole, they need to be subordinated to. They are still, they are in fact a means to an end. Um, uh, and Neil, yes, he do, he is explicitly saying the ends justify the means. Um, no question. But my point is that I think that we can see a kind of uh, that we can see a kind of tension here um, between the collective and the individual. Um, where does... Well, not just where does value lie, um, but what's what's most... Because they, they, they do seem to push in different directions. If you value the collective and you say nothing matters as much as humanity as a whole, then you... The, that, that, the, the pressure of that is to subordinate individuals to the whole, is to suppress individual distinction. You're not separating yourself from the whole. You're supposed to submit to the whole, right? Um, but then, 
that the other concept, the concept of that solitary, luminous genius that was Mesa Rackham, which was the only thing that saved humanity before, pushes in exactly the opposite direction, right? Um, that, no, it's all about cultivating those individuals. It's all about separating them, in a sense, in a, and I recognize it's in a different sense, but in a sense, putting them above. They're more important than the whole, right? Um, so, is it worth destroying Ender's life if it can save all of humanity? Yes. Um, is it worth ignoring and, de you know, disenfranchising all of humanity for the sake of Ender Wigan? Yes, it is. Because he's more important than everybody else, right? So you see that the, it's, again, I'm not saying that it's a contradiction. I'm saying it's a, it's a tension. We can see both of those factors, I think, involved in Graf's thinking and fundamentally involved in this story. Um, and that, I think, is a really, is a really fascinating thing. Look m more on this. Here's, um, here's, here's Graf again. Next chapter. This is right after he's getting off the rocket um, and explaining that he's not Ender's friend. Then too bad. Look, Ender, I'm sorry if you're lonely and afraid, but the buggers are out there. Ten billion, a hundred billion, a million billion of them for all we know, with as, many sh with, with as many ships for all we know, with weapons we can't understand, and a willingness to use those weapons to wipe us out. It isn't the world at stake, Ender, just us, just humankind. As far as the rest of the biosphere is concerned, we could be wiped out, and it would just adjust. It would get on with the next step in evolution. But humanity doesn't want to die. As a species, we have evolved to survive. And the way we do it is by straining and straining, and at last every few generations giving birth to genius. The one who invents the wheel, and light, and flight. The one who builds a city, a nation, an empire. Do you understand any of this? Ender thought he did, but he wasn't sure, so he said nothing. No, of course not, so I'll put it bluntly. Human beings are free except when humanity needs them. Maybe humanity needs you to do something. Maybe humanity mean needs me to find out what you're good for. We might both do despicable things, Ender, but if humankind survives, then we were good tools. Is that all? Just tools? Individual human beings are all tools that the others use to help us all survive. See, here I think we can see that tension spelled out even more starkly, uh, stated more boldly. Because um, you can see, you see how it goes in both directions? Here again, his speech goes in both directions. Again, on the one hand, humankind, the collective, wants to survive. How does humankind survive? By giving birth to genius. Um, but, it, but it's the individual, right? Um, there's, a, there's a kind of... There's a real fuzziness in this thinking, right? Um, as if the desire to survive on the part of the collective led to a conscious choice to produce an individual of genius, right? And that's doesn't seem to be a very sensible way to describe what's going on, not at least in humans. Um, human beings are free except when humanity needs them. Maybe humanity needs you. So again, you might be one of those individuals of genius. You might be one of those individuals that rise above the collective. Um, and if so, your responsibility is to sacrifice yourself for the collective. That you are um, you're a tool. All individual human beings are tools, he says, that others use to help us all survive. Notice there are three players in that equation, right? Three variables in that equation. There's the tool. There's the one who's using the tool, and there's the everybody that survives as a consequence of the tool being used. Um, and Graf here is, though he's speaking in general terms there, seems to have 
thinking back to his previous paragraph there, very specifically himself and Ender involved, right? Ender is the tool, he is the one who is using the tool, and humanity is the one who is hopefully surviving because of both the tool and because of the use that he puts the tool to. Um, yeah, yeah, um... Yeah, and you're right, April. Ender really does internalize this. The way that Ender um, relates to this, to these issues, um, this is going to be something that I'm going to want to be looking at. As I say, I think that this is um, one of the things that, to me, makes this book so fascinating. Is not merely the fact that we get these ideas and themes which run through the book, but the way in which the book invites us to re-examine these ideas as we go along, as I alluded to before. I think that this in particular is going to be a theme which becomes transformed by the end of this book, um, where one of those things where we look back at, we will look back at these passages at the beginning, and I may actually do that way, I may actually bring these slides up again, um, you know, uh, three weeks from now, and when we look at them again from the point of view of the end of the book, they, they begin to look very different. Um, we get a, 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 a completely new insight into what was going on here, uh, and into this idea that's being that uh, that the text is pointing to, and that's one of the things that I think is really that I think is really fascinating. Um, uh, good. Let's see. Just looking at a few uh, at a few other comments here. Um, Interesting, Thomas thinking of the, uh, you know, the, the the straining and straining of humanity, uh, giving birth to genius. And Tom Hillman asks, is the production of the genius, the purpose of the straining, or merely the result? There's a difference. Um, I agree, uh, Tom. The way that Graf talks about it here, he makes it sound purposive, doesn't he? Uh, you know, he makes it sound almost as if humanity is collectively sentient. Um, and desiring its own survival, seeing, discerning in some sense what is necessary for the survival of its collective self, uh, and purposing to produce it. And again, I'm not saying that that is the world that we're being given in this book, or even necessarily that that is in fact what Graf himself believes. But that's what his words here do seem to suggest, doesn't it? Um, which is a really interesting way to look at um, to look at humanity. At the end of the day, I guess I would sum up to say the the sort of you know Colonel Graf worldview that we're given in these two speeches, you know, sort of the insight into the Colonel the Graf worldview that we're given in these two speeches is the fact that a individuals matter. Clearly, in, individuals matter. He's not obviously not saying that all that matters is just humanity. Individuals matter because they are the ones, uh, you know, they, they, they are the, you know, the, it's in particular, these few individuals of these few strategic individuals of genius um, are the ones that make all the, that are the difference between survival and not survival. However, um, he radically de- humanizes, and that's a word I want to use very cautiously in the context of this class, um, he radically dehumanizes human beings, um, dehumanizes individuals. Um, they're tools. They're just tools. Um, and their purpose is to support and protect the collective. Only humanity, the collective, matters. Um, Notice his, uh, one other thing that I would point out is the limitation of his generality here. Um, he's not saying you're fighting for Earth. He's not fighting for Earth. He's fighting for humanity, right? Notice how Graf even points out, actually, humanity could go extinct, and the Earth wouldn't actually care. Uh, in fact, though he doesn't say it, one might be tempted to add, add Earth might get on a quite, quite, a, quite a good deal better, actually, uh, if, if humanity went extinct. Um, but nevertheless, um, he, he, he recognizes it's not even about Earth. Um, so although he generalizes, he selectively generalizes. Um, and that's why I keep emphasizing individual versus collective, because that's where he's, you know, 
his words are not patriotic. Okay? He's not saying, do it for your country, do it for your world. He's saying, do it for your species. Do it for your race, understanding race uh, in the broad sense of the human race as a whole. Um, again, it's not, it's not, it, this is not a planetary battle. This is an interspecies battle between humanity and the buggers. Um, so again, so that's why I um, speak in terms of the individual and the collective, because I think that that is really sort of the, the, the sort of, uh, the essence of that. Um, uh, Jonathan asks, does the third child imply that the government was planning some kind of eugenics program to lead to Ender? That is, to me, a little bit unclear. I mean, on the one hand, yes, obviously, in in the localized sense, that is to say, um, the you know, Peter was so intelligent and so promising, apart from the fact that he was whacked. But, you know, apart from the fact that he's a sadistic uh, jerk, he he was really an excellent prospect. Valentine turned out also pretty well, but she was uh, too, you know... To, uh, is anyone else reminded of, you know, Goldilocks and the Three Bears when you, <laughs> when you get to Peter and Valentine and Ender? But anyway, um, uh, so obviously in that kind of a localized sense, Jonathan, we do have... Um, you know, something that could be called eugenics. Is there any kind of a broader eugenics program, you know, that is to say uh, it w was there generational planning that went into this? For that, I don't see any obvious evidence. Um, I, maybe I missed something, but um, but I uh, um, I, I don't th I mean, because, you know, when we get the background of Ender's parents, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of ex-Catholic and the sort of ex-Mormon um, we, I don't see there any obvious, um, uh, you know, sort of government plan to bring those two people together in the hopes that they're going to generate the, uh, the hopes that they're going to generate the Superman. No, Jonathan, clearly Ender is not, uh, uh, is, is, uh, uh, is not the Kwisatz Haderach. Um, that's a totally different question. And if, uh, we talk about Dune. We can talk about that, but that's exactly the kind of uh, the kind of eugenics, the kind of long-term eugenics program that we see in Dune, um, is I think exactly what I don't see. Um, uh, is exactly what I don't see going on. Any clear evidence going on in Ender's Game? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, um, and. Sean uh, says, I, I, I agree also, this is another uh, good point, that uh, Ender's parents do appear to be together voluntarily. Sean says, you know, this is not one of uh, Plato's bastards raised in a bureau. Um, yeah, you know, Plato's idea that uh, children should be taken away from their birth parents and, and, and you know, raised uh, in a drawer, uh, you know, separately by the, you know, by the community. Um, uh, yeah, no, I don't, I, I, I don't see, uh, apart from the... Um, Apart from the restrictions on reproduction and the um, the special dispensation given in the hope that these partic these two parents would produce the third child, um, they see basically that seems to me um, a sort of <laughs> you can have a crime of opportunity. Can you have eugenics of opportunity, right? You know, basically, you're like, hey, you know, you two, I don't know what it is about you two, right? You two are neither one of you, Ender's parents, neither one of you particularly admirable or impressive in yourselves, but you guys have a gift of making smart children, so we're going to let you keep doing, carry on making smart children uh, in the hopes that we get the right one. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, Anyway, okay. Um, look at how now. I want to. I want to take this idea. You know, so go back to our big thought of this. Um, you know, this question of humanity as a whole and the individual, um, and what humanity must do to survive, and the use of individ, You know, human in, individual human beings are all tools and all that stuff. Um, that's the big scale, right? This is graph speaking in large theoretical terms. Um, we also see things like this working out on a smaller scale, too. Um, this is Graf talking to Ender, asking him, why did you kick Stilson when he was, when he was down? 
Tell me why you kept on kicking him. You had already won. Knocking him down won the first fight. I wanted to win all the next ones, too, so they'd leave me alone. Ender couldn't help it. He was too afraid, too ashamed of his own acts. Though he tried not to, he cried again. Ender did not like to cry, and rarely did. Now in less than a day he had done it three times, and each time was worse. To cry in front of his mother and father and this military man, that was shameful. You took away the monitor, Ender said. I had to take care of myself, didn't I? Okay. Um, why does Ender kick Stilson when he's down? I had to take care of myself, didn't I? Remember the way that when he's making the decision, right, he kicks Stilson in the chest and knocks Stilson down. Stilson is out. He's won the fight already, as he recognizes. Why does he carry on? He does that rational analysis, right? If I let him go, if I let it go at this, they're going to come after me again tomorrow, right? Um, I need to win so spectacularly that I totally put them off. Um, okay, that makes sense. Remember, when he's thinking through this, he does it knowing he, he, he recognizes the taboo, right? One thing that people don't do is just not accept it in the adult world is to kick somebody when he's already down. Ender thinks about that, recognizes that, uses that as a factor in his reasoning to say, I am going to deliberately break that taboo. I am going to, to deliberately go outside that social restriction, which is customarily observed by everybody, in order to achieve the effect that, rationally, I believe is necessary under these circumstances. So he is going to... So in doing that, he is, in a sense, self-consciously breaking with... Uh, with... Human, he's like dehumanizing himself. Um, there are two things that we get here, I think, which are both really fascinating and which the story insists on in equal portions here. One, the inhumanity of the action that he performed, um, which Ender is aware of, which he feels very keenly, right? And two, the fact that he feels it very keenly, <laughs> um, the fact that he, uh, the you know, when he uh, when he walks away from having uh, kicked Stilson, as we will learn, to death, um, he uh, goes around the corner and cries. He is hurt by what he's done. Um, when we're thinking about this, this is in part my own bias, my own tendency. Um, and here I mean not just my own bias towards this book, but my own bias as a reader in general. Um, I dislike investing in the psych... talking about the psychology of a character um, as I would talk about the psychology of an actual human being. Um, because Ender's not a real person. He's a character in this book. All we know about him is what we're told here. What I prefer to be thinking about that is so. A lot of people like to you know want to debate. Um, is you know okay. Peter seems to be a psychopath. Is Ender a psychopath as well? You can make an argument one way or the other, I think about that. But I don't find, in the end, I don't find that argument to be the most interesting argument. Mostly because in order to fill out, you know, sort of the complete psychological um, uh, profile of the character, we have to do a lot of fiction. We have to do a lot of imaginative investment ourselves. We're only told so much about what he thinks. 
and you can say that these things that he thinks are you know a sort of evidence that point in this direction or that um but for me i am um i am more interested in thinking about the role that these characters have in the story um again not trying to imagine them as if they were real people as if you know as if in reading about this character i'm 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 trying to understand um another you know, a uh, 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 fully realized human being, but rather to see to to look at the characters as um, not only just them themselves, but what they think and what they do, and the part that it plays in the story that we're given. I realize, by the way, that in doing this, uh, that in confessing this bias, I am, in a sense, alienating myself from the flow of humanity in my culture almost as much as Ender was when he kicked Stilson to death. Um, people who read books and watch movies and everything nowadays are all about characters. Like, story... Uh, character is number one, and story is a distant second um, in most people's minds. For most people's minds, reading a book is all about characters. Writing a book is all about characters. Um, uh, I, this, is, this always strikes me, whenever I'm listening to authors, most of them you know, will just talk about their characters, and rarely about crafting a story. It's just like, you know, I just invest myself in these characters and then see what the characters would do and what would happen. Uh, again, not that all characters... Um, uh, do that, uh, or, or the, you know that all that all, all all authors think that way through their kid, but some of them do, and I've heard uh, several authors uh, talking like that. Um, uh, it's of course you know even more common I think um, in uh, in in the film genre. Um, but I really like story, um, and to me story is always even more interesting uh, than character. Um, Yeah. It's not that I don't like characters, but I know lots of people. Um, if I want to study human psychology, I've got lots of people uh, that I can study. Um, but story. Story is different, man. Um, I read a book because I like stories. If I just wanted to meet people, I'd, 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 I'd walk out the door. Uh, anyway, again, my own bias. You don't have to agree with me. It's fine. I'm totally fine with that. Um, but... Um, uh, but anyway, that's that's he's confessing my own bias, and so I want to be thinking about Ender. My own conversation about Ender, I know, is going to be focused um, <clears throat> in that direction. I am thinking about <clears throat> Ender's choices here. What we can see really clearly already is the way in which Ender's life, even before he is being explicitly manipulated into this position by Graf and the Battle School. Um, his life is already becoming a microcosm of the human situation, right? Um, the preemptive strike that he makes against Stilson here is directly parallel to the preemptive strike that we will later on learn that humanity is in the middle of making against the buggers. The situation is precisely the same. They were attacked. They were attacked by a larger, more powerful bully from outside. Right? So what can they do? The only thing that they can do, the only way to take care of themselves, right, is to strike back, not just to win the first fight, but to win all the next ones too. And to do it preemptively, not to wait for the other fights. You know, not like I won this fight today and I'm going to train and train and train so when you attack me tomorrow, I'll beat you up again tomorrow and then I'll beat you up the day after that. No, that's not the strategy, right? Instead, the strategy is to pour it on so that you win, and you don't have to... You've got to take care of yourself, right? That is the calculus of victory here that Ender makes. And he, and I think it is significant that he draws exactly the same conclusion that the military draws. Um, uh, Jonathan says, Is Ender already in a state of war with other humans? Well, he's in a state of war with these bullies who are picking on him. Um... Uh, I mean, did, did he knows, as he says, this is not going to end happily, right? He knows he's just about to get the crap beat out of him. So he decides that if somebody's going to get the crap beat out of him, it isn't him. Is he acting despicably? Put in parallel his rationale here and what, how Graf was just talking about humanity, right? Humanity does what it needs to do in order to survive. That's what it does, Right? 
And if it has to destroy other things in order to protect itself, it does that. If it has to sacrifice some elements of itself in order to do that, it does that. And that's what Ender did, right? And he is sacrificing, right? He's sac- I mean, his, 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 his conscience, his own better feelings, he is harmed, and he knows he is harmed by this. Um, he's not proud of this. He is not um, oblivious to the consequences of this. Um, but it has... Um, but it's it's happened. Um, it had to be done. And so he did it. Um, and this is why, you know, th- th- this is... Um, in and and so and and therefore in a sense in order for humanity to continue it has to become less humane right in order for him to survive he has to um in order for him to be to continue to be a part of the human race he has to separate himself from the human race again this is what he what he concludes here um and again, as I as as I want to emphasize, and I think it's really important because it's a ama- it's it, the text seems to me to very strongly emphasize this um, in these early sections. Ender is really torn up by what he is doing. Um, we see this even more explicitly in the Bernard incident when he breaks Bernard's arm. Ender felt sick. He had only meant to catch the boy's arm. No, no, he had meant to hurt him, and he had pulled with all his strength. He hadn't meant it to be so public. But the boy was feeling exactly the pain Ender had meant him to feel. No gravity had betrayed him, that was all. I'm Peter. I'm just like him. And Ender hated himself. Um, Peter, and we'll come back to Peter. We'll talk about Peter more um, uh, in the next, you know, in the section when we get uh, when you know when Peter features uh, even more. Um, when we do the Locke and Demosthenes thing, we'll 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 spend some time with Peter. Um, uh, Peter is invoked as like a kind of emblem uh, in this book. Uh, he is, um, you know, I'm not saying the book is an allegory, but he is a symbol. He becomes a friender. He is explicitly a symbol. Um, he becomes within the computer program, with, within the within the game, uh, the mind game. Uh, he becomes explicitly a symbol. Um, uh, anyway, um, and Sean, you're right. Sean Smith, you're right to say that this incident, the breaking of Bernard's arm, is not Ender's fault in the same way as the death of Stilson. It's not. Um, it's true that Ender didn't plan for Stilson to die, but he did plan to heap precisely the kind of suffering on Stilson that he received. Um, Although he did plan to hurt him, I, I think one of the things that I find interesting in this passage is that I think that we see Ender being a little unfair with himself here. Yes, he meant to he meant to strike back against Bernard. He meant to hurt him, as he said. He was preemptively defending himself again um, to stop. Um, he was responding to the provocation that Bernard was giving him, to the pain Bernard was inflicting upon him, with extreme prejudice in order to discourage such in the future, right? But he didn't realize what was going to happen. Now, of course, Sean, you could say that's exactly the same as with Stilson, right? He meant to uh, 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 to to leave him, as his friends say, completely wasted. He didn't recognize, he didn't understand, he didn't know that that would lead to Stilson's death. Um, so to here, he didn't know that it was going to fling Bernard across the room and end up breaking his arm, but nevertheless, he still did what he meant to do. Um, but again, but I would, um, I would point to what I think is a really important element in, in Ender's character, is this element of almost confession here. Um, you know, his being honest with himself, being brutally honest with himself... Um, he is not deceiving himself that what he's doing is is good, is okay. And this seems to me the primary way in which Ender 
differs from humanity. Again, it was, you know, it was suggesting, I, I mean, I think it's really clear, especially with the Stilson situation, that um, we are being given Ender versus Stilson and his gang as a very explicit foil for humanity versus the buggers um, at the beginning of this book. I mean, that, that parallel seems to me ironclad. Um, but what differentiates the small-scale version, Ender versus Stilson, from the large-scale version, Humanity versus the Buggers, is remorse. Ender feels bad about it. Humanity, less so. Either about what they do to the Buggers, um, or about what they are doing to themselves. That is, like, what Graf is doing to Ender, right? Um the ones who use the tools and what they do to the tools, the way that the individual treats the collective, and the way that it... Or, wait, other way around. The way that the collective treats the individual, and the way that it views the individual. Again, thinking of Graf's language here. Um, that's... Um, Ender is very different in that way, and this is one of the things that I think we are given to really hold on to. Um, that Ender... Ender's own experience, on the one hand, I think it puts us as readers into a really sort of psychologically and emotionally complex relationship with this whole world that we're being given. On the one hand, we find it repellent. Um, just as, on one level, Ender finds his own actions against Stilson and against Bernard repellent. Um, the overt bloodthirstiness, right? The whole cultural movement of, no, 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 let's encourage children to uh, to play with weapons and to practice butchering buggers because that's the training they're going to need, right? Um, you know, uh, the only good bugger is a dead bugger, right? That whole kind of um, the suppression of any element of, you know, mercy or tenderness, the fact that, you know, Valentine is just too soft, right? We can't have that kind of thing, Um we need somebody hard. A little less crazy than Peter, but somebody hard, right? Um, there's no remorse. There's no recognition as humanity is becoming less humane, um, as it is becoming um, inhuman, as it is in the same way that Ender self-consciously stepped out of, you know, crossed that boundary of, you know, what it's okay for humans to do, uh, for, you know, for adult humans to do anyway. Um, just as Ender self-consciously stepped beyond that, so humanity has sort of stepped beyond the whole peace and love thing, right? Um, no, it's about aggression. It's about training. It's about preparing for ruthlessness, right, when the buggers return. And encouraging, therefore, we see as a consequence that same ruthlessness in their attitude towards each other. Um, and, um, but again, with Ender, the big difference with Ender is that he... Um, he feels bad about it. Um, he hates himself for this. Um, he sees, at the same time that he's going, you know, so on the one hand, his choices seem almost to, um, uh, seem almost to, uh, um, uh, his own choices seem almost to excuse what humanity is doing. I mean, again, like, put in that position you know, it is in fact the shrewdest thing to do, Ender concludes, right? Like, I mean, it, it's almost as if Ender's actions, in paralleling those of the military branch that is about to be oppressing him, he, it's almost as if he is sort of complicit in that, right? Um, he has made the same choices that they are making. Um, the ruthlessness that he was showing is the same ruthlessness of which he is going to be the victim. But at the same time, it's also an indictment of those things. His own, the way, the, the damage that it seems to do to him is, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is in itself an indictment of it. He doesn't, as Sharon, as Sharon Powell says, he doesn't enjoy, uh, dehumanizing himself. No, he doesn't. Um, Sean says the parallel is even better when you understand the nature of the buggers better. Yeah, it is, isn't it? We'll get to that. Wait for it. Wait for it. We're not there yet. Um, uh, uh, Hans wants to talk about uh, um, 
what made Peter too ruthless? Where do we draw the line between Peter and Ender? Wait for it, Hans. Wait for it. We're going to come back to it. We'll talk about Peter later. Um, I, I, we'll get much more data on Peter later on. So I, 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 I want to I hold off on Peter for now. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sarah, you know, you make a really good point. And I, several people are um, um, uh, saying this, a similar kind of thing. Sarah King says, Ender apparently doesn't loathe himself enough not to do the same thing again, though. No, but that doesn't make him loathe himself any less, right? Um, that is, we, I get, we see this within Ender. He sees what must be done. He sees what he has to do, you know, what he believes must happen in order for him to survive. He also sees the damage that it's doing. Um, he hates it. Um, it's the self, it's Ender's self awareness that really separates him, I think, um, from, uh, from everyone else. And it's one of the things that I want to come back to here with Ender, because again, there is a way in which from uh, from beginning to end of this book, Ender is a microcosm of humanity. Um, that he is, you know, he is the individual who is the collective, you know, who represents the collective, who stands for the collective, um, uh, and who sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally recapitulates the choices of humanity. Um, of the collective, but he is more self-aware. He's not doing it unconsciously. Um, so hang on to that. We'll 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 um, we'll see what we think as we as we go through. Um, there's much more to see there. Um, I, I want to shift topics here. <clears throat> We're starting to run out of time. Um, but uh, let me see if I can get through a, a, a few more things here. I want to at least acknowledge uh, this other theme, um, which in the end I, I find connected uh, to the one we've been talking about. And that, and that is the issue of shifting points of view. That thing which is described as one of Ender's great strengths, one of the things that separates him from almost everybody else at battle school, and we see it right away on the rocket. Um, this is Ender, of course, boarding the shuttle. He walked the short bridge to the door in the shuttle. He noted that the wall to his right was carpeted like a floor. That was where the disorientation began. The moment he thought of the wall as a floor, he began to feel like he was walking on a wall. He got to the ladder and noticed that the vertical surface behind it was also carpeted. I'm climbing up the floor, hand over hand, step by step. And then for fun, he pretended that he was climbing down the wall. He did it almost instantly in his mind, convinced himself, against the best evidence of gravity, until he reached an empty seat. He found himself gripping the seat tightly, even though gravity pulled him firmly against it. The other boys were bouncing on their seats a little, poking and pushing, shouting. Ender carefully found the straps, figured out how they fit together to hold him at crotch, waist, and shoulders. He imagined the ship dangling upside down on the undersurface of the earth, the giant fingers of gravity holding them firmly in place. But we will slip away, he thought. We are going to fall off this planet. He did not know its significance at the time. Later, though, he would remember that it was even before he left Earth that he first thought of it as a planet, like any other, not particularly his own. Okay. Um, a few things here. One thing, of course, you know, again, and this is something that gets repeated um, throughout his time at battle school, is his flexibility of mind, his willingness to abandon a rigid framework of thought and to reorient himself in a way which might be different from other people, which, you know, to, which might uh, be idiosyncratic, but it basically to reorient himself in the way which is most, uh, which is sort of the most advantageous way to look at the situation. Um, uh, we see it this reflected both in small ways, that is, in thinking about the orientation of gravity and imagining the different ways, you know, that one can look at the, the particular cabin that he's in, which is the wall, which is the floor, which is up, which is down. Um, but we can also see it here in larger ways in the comment about the planet Earth there at the bottom, um, that the very concept of 
our being on the earth, of our being from earth, is in this way as arbitrary a frame of reference as up or down, um, that it's all in how you orient yourself, it's all in how you contextualize what your senses are giving you. Again, notice his senses are not telling him anything different. In fact, um, some of his senses are telling him that gravity is still pulling him down, and he's defying his senses in order to convince himself that things are actually working in a different way, that the orientation is in fact different. Um, but but again, it's all about the framework into which he is putting the stimuli of his senses. So instead of imagining, um, you know, him sitting on the earth, like, you know, in the normal default, mo default mode of perception that almost nobody ever, uh, ever questions, instead he imagines himself on the chair being barely pulled in, held in by, uh, held upside down on the underside of the earth, um, you know, suspended held on, held up by gravity, by the fingers of gravity, and that they're not going to shoot up from the planet, but they're going to fall off the planet. Um, but again, notice how that gets broadened, how that gets generalized into his the whole sense of his own identity, right? That even before he leaves Earth, he thinks of it for the first time as a planet like any other, not particularly his own. Um, Earth is just a planet. It's one of many planets. Um, you know, just as, uh, you know, you can redefine up and down, you can redefine the framework in which you look at things, um, so too here he is, he can redefine his sen his concept of the planet, of home, um, of himself and where he belongs. All of these things also are all a question of how you orient yourself, how you, um, uh, how you, uh, how you imagine yourself as being related. And yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, Justin and Hans are both, Justin Crumley and Hans Rose are both pointing to um, exactly the same thing I was thinking here. That is that we can see here again another instance, or rather a parallel instance, of, of what we were looking at before. Uh, Justin Crumley says uh, that seems to be more dehumanizing himself, disconnecting himself um, with mankind, and Hans says like ignoring society's taboos. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's that kind of a redefinition, right? Just as um, uh, it's like the way in which um, think of, again back to Graf's speech about humanity and the rest of the biosphere right um, I, many people might think of the war between uh, the humans and the buggers as though again as the war between earth and, and you think about you know the majority of uh, you know alien uh, uh, of alien invasion movies and uh, stories like that very often, usually, those are um, uh, depicted in sort of a fundamentally patriotic framework, right? Um, you're not fighting for humanity. I mean, sometimes you're fighting for humanity, but, but, but you're just as likely, the language that's used is just as likely to be you're fighting for Earth, right? It's Earth, this is Earth versus Mars, man. You know, we're, we're uh, uh, you know, we, we've got to defend the Earth. Um, graph sort of reorients that, right? Now, actually, Earth doesn't care, right? Um, the rest of the biosphere doesn't care. This is just about humanity uh, and about its position. And yeah, Hans, uh, Hans goes on to add, he redefines up and down, left and right, and in a sense, right and wrong. Um, yes, and that's exactly the same calculation that we have seen humanity as a whole making, and that's what the evidence seems to be. Um, you know, thinking back to the conversation we were having about the beginning of the evidence that we see of this society and the nature of this society and the consequences of that post-bugger invasion uh, 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 culture that we see happening here, that, that again, that not post-apocalyptic but post-almost-apocalyptic um, uh, culture... Uh, seems to be exactly those kind of no. Let's let's now let's redefine in light of this. Let's redefine. Um, uh, let's re redefine right and wrong. Um, again, I don't think that that's the only way to sort of to look at it's to look at the reorientation thing, or even to look at that culture. It's not that they've just said, "Hey, let's chuck out the idea of right and wrong and decide it's whatever we want it to be." Um, in that way, I don't think it does. Doesn't fit perfectly. Um, you know, Ender's orientation system 
can, you know, especially, you know, his whole argument is that in no gravity, it is perfectly arbitrary which way you consider up and down. You just arbitrarily decide based on what's most advantageous to yourself. Um, and, uh, and Hans, I do see your parallel, right? You know, he is deciding, uh, you know, kicking, uh, 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 kicking the tar out of Stilson is wrong, but uh, I, it is advantageous to myself, so I'm going to do that. But again, notice, Hans, he, it's not that he decides that it's right, right? Um, when he decides what's up and what's down and what's left and what's right in the battle room, um, uh, he just sort of makes that decision and he doesn't, there's, he rejects any external framework. Morally, he does not uh, object, he does not reject an external framework. Um, he still does believe in a moral right and wrong. Um, he's just conscious of transgressing it. Um, uh, that's why I don't think... Yeah, see, Tom, I, I resist that. I resist the idea that we, we have no gravity and no morality. It's not no. Um, not for Ender, it's not. Um, nobody's more aware than he is of the way in which he is transgressing that in the way in the way in which he is um uh sort of morally separating himself but um uh but he does it right um so i so i i i totally see the parallel i think um uh i think that it's i th- I think that that's really good. I think it, in some ways it really works, but I don't go all the way with it because, again, I, I think that um, Ender insists that that's not exactly the case. Um, but I, I agree. It's not just you know not to get caught up on the moral thing. Um, I, I can agree. Sharon Powell says I don't think Ender is distancing himself from humanity, but rather redefining humanity in himself as space going instead of earthbound. Yeah, sure. If you think about um, you know, human be- again. If you if if you draw that distinguishing line, I get thinking of as I was suggesting before, Graf's comment about Earth and the biosphere and humanity, um, differentiating those things and not just um, accepting Earth as the, you know, defining Earth as the habitat of humanity and defining humanity as the species, you know, the dominant species of Earth. Um, if you're willing to kind of reorient yourself there in the way that that Ender reorients his own directions, you can think about humanity and other things quite differently. Um, so you're right, uh, uh, Sharon, I agree that there's, um, um, there is, uh, th- there, there are other, you know, it, it, it's, it's not all about the moral thing. Um, interesting, though, I find that uh, in this way. Um, consider this other moment. This is Ender in the game room, uh, competing against the older boys, remember? This is him watching the games. Ender liked it better, though, when two boys played against each other. Then they had to use each other's tunnels, and it became and it quickly became clear which of them was worth anything at the strategy of it. Within an hour or so, it began to pall. Ender understood the regularities by then, understood the rules the computer was following, so that he knew he could always, once he mastered the controls, outmaneuver the enemy. Spirals when the enemy was like this, loops when the enemy was like that, lie in wait, lie in wait at one trap, lay seven traps, and then lure them like this. There was no challenge to it then, just a matter of playing until the computer got so fast that no human reflexes could overcome it. That wasn't fun. It was the other boys he wanted to play. The boys who had been trained so trained by the computer that even when they played against each other, they tried to emulate the computer, think like a machine instead of a boy. So you'll see the, the, the wider applicability that we're being invited to give to this idea of uh, being constrained within, uh, within particular conventional frameworks, right? Being shown, like, this is the way things work, this is how you're supposed to think, Ender's genius lies in not conforming with those modes of thought, right? He is the first and the quickest to recognize, especially in no gravity, direction is arbitrary, right? Um, and if you constrict yourself to thinking as if gravity is there, which is not there, then your whole frame of reference uh, becomes limiting. Um, so to here, um, 
the boys are really used to playing against the computer, and so the computer has trained them. They're each trying to emulate the computer. They, they all eventually lose to the computer. Um, so the computer obviously knows the best way to play, right? So you try to do what the computer does um, instead of thinking not like a computer, but thinking like a boy. That is, not thinking like a machine, not thinking like a unit, uh, but thinking like an individual. Here again, I think that we can sort of see, notice what, what um, well, anyway, what strikes me as a kind of parallel tension here between the collective and the individual. Um, here, it's very clear. This is, we see Ender as individual very clearly here. And again, this is what makes Ender different more than, you know, more than anything else. The primary place where his genius lies is in not conforming um, with these default ways of looking at things. And yet, we see him at battle school being carefully conditioned, being trained to sacrifice himself for the collective, being, being, uh, being trained to fit within the role that they have laid out for him um, uh, as part of the collective. Um, so I think that there's a, um, there's a real um, uh, there's an echo here um, or rather than saying there's an echo of that same theme I guess the way I would say it is when we look at Ender in these when we see him acting in these ways when we see him differentiating himself in this way um, what I think we're seeing is what makes those what defines those how can you tell those Individuals of genius, right? Um, those uh, the, the 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 product of you know humanity striving and striving and striving. Um, uh, how do you know them when you see them? This is what defines an individual, right? Someone who really is able to th who doesn't just plug along like a machine. Someone who doesn't accept uh, the the uh, the attempt to. Uh, train them to think like a human or to think like a, a machine a machine to think like a computer but instead thinks like a human being thinks more idiosyncratically does things their own way instead of in general how they're supposed to be done um there's of course another moment and i'll end with this next one another moment that I found really fascinating in this way. This is Ender playing buggers and astronauts with Peter in Chapter 2, um, and of course, he's made to be the bugger. If I survive the games, thought Ender, he put on the mask. It closed him in like a hand pressed tight against his face. But this isn't how it feels to be a bugger, thought Ender. They don't wear this face like a mask. It is their face. On their home worlds, do the buggers put on human masks and play? And what do they call us? Slimies, because we're so soft and oily compared to them. Watch out, Slimy, Ender said. Here we see Ender. Notice again that the sort of tension here, right? On the one hand, in putting on this mask, he is conforming, right? He is conforming to the game. Kids are supposed to play buggers and astronauts, right? I don't think there's a law in their country, you know, or in the world that every kid has to play buggers and astronauts, but it looks like it's practically a law, right? Every kid is expected to play buggers and astronauts, and sometimes it can get really nasty. Notice, in fact, this dehumanization um, is being systematically encouraged in children, right? Um, but anyway, uh, this is part of the program, right? By putting on the bugger mask, he is, in a sense, conforming to this, you know, the mass of humanity. But at the same time, when he puts the mask on, he's not human, right? He's putting himself in the... he's connecting himself to the buggers. He is seeing things through the buggers' eyes, which he finds really restricting. And he can't see it when Peter smacks him upside the head because he has no peripheral vision in the bugger mask. Um... But of course, he's recognizing this is not, you know, he is, he's keenly aware of the fact that in putting on the bugger mask, 
he is not, in fact, seeing things through Bugger's eyes. But you'll notice that he tries to see things through Bugger's eyes, right? He performs an imaginative exercise. What is it like to be a Bugger? Do they put on human masks? Um, that is to say, you know, the, the fundamental question that that seems to ask is, are they as obsessed with killing us as we are obsessed with killing them? Um, and to ask that question would seem to open the possibility of the quest of the answer, no. A, a, the possibility of which answer the rest of the humans on Earth at this time seem not really to entertain, right? One of the... One of the no. The most fundamental belief that we see in the people of, you know, of the culture of this story, um, the one rock-bottom belief is the buggers are coming for them, right? The, bunder, the buggers have come twice before. Um, they, their intentions towards humans have been proven to be obviously and unremittingly destructive. Um, there is no question that they apparently hate humans and are, you know, wanting to massacre humanity. Um... Uh, is that really what they think? Have they, in other words, have they? do they in their minds, do they demonize us in the same way that we demonize them? But of course, to even ask that question is to humanize them, right? It's to go, to ask that question is to be countercultural all by itself. And exactly, Sean Smith makes an excellent point. Um, the other question is, do they play? Because, yeah, what that invites us to imagine is little, little bugger children, right? Playing. Um, yeah, do they play? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, and Justin Crumley, I think you're absolutely right. You know, this, is, this seems to be the first time he, empath he emphasizes, empathizes with the buggers, uh, joining their side against Peter in this, uh, in this moment in a game. Uh, it was this Ender versus the humans. Well, yeah, you know, there are ways in which Ender and humanity are enemies uh, in this story. Again, the collective versus the individual. The individual must um, submit himself, right? Um, there is a sense in which the total humanity um, is his side, his fundamental allegiance, the one allegiance from which he cannot be uh, fr uh, from which he cannot be exempted. And yet, how you, how do you define it? Is Graf his friend or his enemy? Right, same kind of question. That's the question that he asks. Um, we'll see the same thing with Mesa Rackham later on, um, but. Um, uh, anyway, so, um, again, in this moment, I, uh, I see this moment, the reason I brought in this passage here is that I see this moment as connected um, with the, that same other, the, 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 the business with gravity, the business with thinking like a computer. Um, it does seem, based on everything that we see, Ender's little moment of empathy, or at least even if you don't want to call it, go quite so far as to call it empathy, um, but to say at least his sort of imaginative investment, his willingness to do an even fleeting imaginative investment in actually representing the bugger, um, is like, I think, his ability to reorient himself, directionally speaking, his thinking like a boy and not like a machine, not, not like a computer. Um... It is what makes him different, and uh, uh, and Justin, I really love that idea. The way that this sort of suggests that in doing that, when he does that, he is not just differentiating himself from humans in the sense of showing that he is different, showing that he is smarter, showing that he is a genius compared with them, but also um, drawing our attention to the fact that he's against. Human, that humans are his enemies when he's doing that. Um, uh, and that is something that we do see uh, repeated again and again, I think. Um, yeah, um, yeah, good, good. Um, 
the next thing I wanted to talk about um, was oh wait, well one last note on this of course is that in um, in looking at things from a new perspective here in sort of briefly imaginatively redefining what down is um, he is becoming imaginatively again literally inhuman in order to do so um, in setting himself against humanity and differentiating himself from humanity he becomes in this moment monstrous right um, and characterizing his fellow human beings in their humanity right as slimies, right? Soft and oily compared to them. Um, so again, we see that differentiation really weighted, really fraught um, with that issue of humanity and inhumanity um, and uh, with monstrosity. Even the buggers are monstrous. Peter is monstrous. Um, Ender does things which people consider monstrous, um, which seem on which he feels are monstrous. Um, where are the boundaries? Where do we, how do we reconcile these things? How do we fit all of these things together? Um, I was going to go on and talk about the giant's drink, as I said, um, but we'll save that, and that's fine, because I kind of wanted to connect it with the end of the world stuff. I love the mind game, the computer game. Um, I think it's really cool, and I want to spend some time to talking about that. We'll talk about, um, you know, his time in the armies, of course, and his uh, the beginning of his career in the battle room. Um, but I plan to spend an unashamedly large amount of the second class on uh, his uh, on the giant's drink and fairyland and the end of the world. Um, uh, so I'm just going to warn you about that in advance. So I encourage you, uh, I hope that you are, even those of you who are very familiar with this book, I hope you're rereading it. Um, this should at least be a good excuse to read the book again. Um, and as you do reread, I hope you will reread the chapters for next time. And I want you to pay especially close attention uh, to um, both his time in the, uh, in the game world, in the mind game, and, his, uh, and the reactions to it um, by, uh, by Graf and others. So anyway, that's what we're gonna do. Well, it's not that all all that we're gonna do, but again, I, I'm definitely gonna be gonna be doing some things there. Um, so thanks very much uh, for joining me for this first class. Our next class is uh, next Tuesday, uh, same time. Um, uh, you can find the link for this session on the class webpage. I'll be posting it. And we'll be posting it on social media and stuff. But um, but you can, you can definitely look for that. Uh, you can follow along. You can register for our our, our other sessions in advance. Um, uh, so anyway, I um, I'm glad you guys could all join me tonight. Thanks for your questions and comments. You guys were great today. Uh, so I hope you'll be able to join me next week, and I look forward to talking to you then. Bye now. Good night. <laughs>